afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Wild Neighbors Speaker Series. We're very happy to have you here today. This series is a collaboration with Travis County and the City of Austin, who co-manages the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, along with another other, a number of other private and public partners. Before we get started, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Jeremy Hull, and I'm the Volunteer Coordinator for Travis County Natural Resources. Today, we're very lucky to have author Jennifer Bristol here to talk to us about her book, Parking Lot Birding and uh, Purple Martins. After the presentation, Jaya Torres with the City of Austin will manage a Q&A session. So please feel free to put all your questions in the Q&A box and not the chat. Um, there will be a recording of this webinar posted to Facebook and YouTube to be used as a future resource. And on that note, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Jennifer. Thanks, Jeremy, and um, and thanks for, for hosting me here. I'm very excited. Uh, obviously, I have a, a, a wonderful and special connection uh, with uh, the Balcones uh, Canyonlands Preserve Systems. Uh, as my mom was a tra Travis County Commissioner that helped uh, get those established, so always a special place uh, in my heart uh, for, for those lands and, and all those that manage it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and... Um, and kind of get started here. I'll leave my uh, my camera on. And um, again, if you have questions and stuff, uh, you know, feel free to post them there in the Q and A. Uh, and hopefully, I can answer those. But I can't make any promises that I always can. So, as Jeremy mentioned, uh, I am the author of um, Parking Lot Birding: A Fun Guide to Discovering Birds in Texas. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, but then we'll also talk about uh, the Purple Martins, which uh, I, I consider them, uh, as well as the uh, Great Tail Grackles parking lot royalty. Um, and so we will uh, talk about these fascinating birds um, that are about to give us one of the greatest spectaculars, um, nature spectaculars that, Travis, uh, that Central Texas and Travis County uh, have to offer. Uh, the, the picture on the book um, are the other parking lot royalty, which are the uh, great tail grackles uh, in February when they roost up. So they're kind of on the opposite end uh, of, the, of the purple martins. So just a little bit about my birding journey. Um, I, uh, I did not start off um, being um, wanting a, a, a career in conservation. Uh, I actually uh, worked in the film industry for a long time. And uh, then I was a marketing executive for a while. Uh, I own my own business. And then um, I decided nature was really what drives me, what moves me, and, um, and made the jump over to become the uh, natural resource manager for Bastrop State Park. I uh, changed careers um, and jobs three months before the devastating fire um, out there in the park. And um, uh, but I remained on as the friend, president of the Friends Group and helped them raise a bunch of money um, for the restoration projects out there in Bastrop. Um, and I, I was just out there a couple weeks ago, and I, I, I love how the forest is looking, even though it's very dry right now. Um, when I changed um, jobs, I went to work for um, Campfire Central Texas, which is a wonderful organization that helps get kids outside. Uh, and I really was starting to focus more on youth. I wanted kids uh, to have experiences in nature um, because we were starting to see more of the research coming forward saying that children were spending between seven and 11 hours per day indoors, sedentary with media um, at alarming rates. And so I wanted to start the journey towards um, changing that. And I was able to do so by becoming um, the first director for Texas Children and Nature with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And I was there for seven years uh, and helped shape that program and, um, and really digest just mountains and mountains of research um, that, that showed the connection between how when children, and not just children, but also adults, um, when we spend more time outside, we're healthier, happier, and smarter. Um, and I just got an email today with some new research coming out that just you know, it just keeps reinforcing that over and over again, um, that we, we need nature and it is not just um, uh, a need, it is really and truly good for us, um, it drives us. 
So uh, when I was at Texas Parks and Wildlife, um, I stumbled across uh, the great Texas birding classic. And I was just getting into birding. Um, I got to the bird party rather late in life. And um, I thought, holy smokes, uh, a competition uh, for birding? Yes, sign me up. And um, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, we we just participated again this um, the spring, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, it is a thrill. Uh, we do the six day classic, so we bird for six solid days. Um, and when I say we, I've roped my mom and my husband into um, that experience, and we go all across Texas uh, in in six days and see how many species we can count um, during that time. Uh, we I do other events too with big sets or. Um, you know, state park big day, those kind of things. But um, it's really exciting. If you haven't done something on the great Texas Birding Classic, it is really, really fun. Um, it's every spring. And um, again, it's through Texas Parks and Wildlife. I highly recommend it. In doing so, I started, you know, um, looking at, uh, thinking about birding and thinking about how do I, um, how do I want to get more people outside, you know? Um, so coming to coming through my, my Texas children nature training, thinking about how do you, um, how do you help people discover nature in a way that's meaningful, um, and, and, and easy. Um, and so I started, um, making the outline for parking lot birding and I wrote it rather quickly. Um, from 2018 to 2019, I was writing it was published in April, 2020. And I had planned this like big book tour and all this fun stuff, um, bird walks and walk and talks and all this stuff. And here comes COVID um, and here comes the lockdown. And of course we were completely locked down in April of 2020. So I had to get creative and, uh, but something magical turned out, um, turned out everybody was home birding. And so, um, they were, and they were looking for, um, you know, local places to go and enjoy the birds. And so, um, thankfully it kind of, um, turned it around and, uh, and made it a positive thing, um, for that. I'm working on two more books. Uh, one is at the publisher right now with, uh, again, with a and Press. And, um, that one is about birding in cemeteries in Texas. Again, wanting to make something easy and, uh, and local. And then, um, the other one is about women and conservation. And so that one, I don't have a published date on yet because I have yet to finish it all the way, um, but it's coming along um, pretty well. So why parking lot birding? Well, first off, the it's the name itself is sort of a running joke um, between my mom and my husband and I, and then it turns out a whole bunch of other birders as well, because we would go on these long hikes to go, you know, we thought, oh, to see the birds, we've got to go way back in the woods and we've got to, you know, really get deep in, into, uh, you know, kind of go miles deep into the parks. And, and yeah, we would, you know, we would see the birds, uh, but it was, it was harder. Uh, and then we would start joking. I'd be like, oh, we must be getting close to the parking lot. We're seeing more birds. And I no way in shape advocate for more parking lots. Um, I am all about conservation and I want even more conservation lands, but sometimes from those contrived spaces like a parking lot or a bird blind or a boardwalk or short nature trail, um, a hawk watch tower, uh, the campus of a nature center, those spaces sometimes make it easier to peer into uh, the habitat and see the birds um, that you're looking for. And, um, and so that became kind of uh, a, the, our joke. And then um, I just liked it. And, uh, and it, as we, as I told other birders about, it, they're like, oh my gosh, we totally know what you mean. Um, and so that became uh, the, the title. As I was working on it, I asked myself a question, you know, why do I want to write this book? And again, I wanted, I wanted to focus on how do you how do you help people have rich experiences in nature without having to hike the south rim of Big Bend um, National Park, which is fantastic, and I'm glad that I have, but you don't have to, to have those rich and amazing experiences outdoors. 
I also wanted it to be easy for people with all mobility types um, to be able to have those experiences and find cool things um, and see the birds uh, and not have, um, you know, feel like they are also included um, in a wonderful way. And that's been something that was really important to me while I was writing um, this book as well as the next one. Um, and then I wanted people, to, I wanted the birds to be easy when they got there. Um, you know, I wanted to send them to places that when they showed up, they're, they're gonna have a good chance of seeing the birds that, that occur there in different seasons. And so it was all about just being easy, easy places to go and get outside. And I think the Purple Martin parties are an awesome example of that. Um, they, uh, they just exemplify um, what it's like to have this super amazing experience in nature, watch something that is so unique and different and cool. Uh, and it just so happens to happen in a parking lot. <laughs> um, this year, um, the parking lot that it will be in is Capitol Plaza, um, which is kind of in central Austin. And um, Travis Audubon hosts these parties. Um, they have them in other cities as well. Houston um, is one of the other cities that they have them in. And, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and they are um, on the weekends. Um, and usually in July and August, I think I think Houston's might just be in July, um, but um, and they're at the, they're at sunset. That's when all the birds come in um, to roost. And so, what's special about a purple martin? Well, first off, here's kind of what it looks like. Um, and yes, if you go to one of the purple martin parties, be sure to take an umbrella or maybe a little poncho or rain slick or something, um, because. There are literally hundreds of thousands of birds flying around you in this hurricane of, uh, uh, you know, just this whirlwind. And sometimes things happen. So be sure to take uh, a little, little precaution there. Um, and so they all come down into these big roosts. And it, I can't even really describe it um, and do it justice as well, but there's just this cacophony of, of sound and then for a split second it'll go silent and it's like some sort of message is being relayed and they'll all take off from the uh, roost again they'll circle around they'll come back down and they re-land uh in in the in the trees and this goes on multiple times um, as they're coming into roost and so the purple martins um they uh they aren't just here in central texas they um, breed, the orange part um, on the map is, uh, is where they breed. Um, and they go all the way up into Canada, not too far into Canada, but, but up into Canada, um, along uh, the south and mostly east of the Rockies. There are some pockets um, that are west of the Rockies, um, but they are, uh, the majority of them um, breed and nest um, east of the Rockies. They'll migrate down through Central America um, and across uh, the Gulf of Mexico as well. Um, they'll sort of hopscotch across the islands in the Caribbean. And they're also known to use um, uh, the oil rigs um, to sort of take a break on and as they move across the Gulf of Mexico. When they return to their wintering grounds, um, they're in six different countries um, throughout South America and, and, and the, the largest um, collection of them is in Brazil um, during the winter months. And so as they move down there, um, you know, they're, they're feeding on insects the whole time. Uh, they winter down there. And then when it's time to come back up, um, they send what are called scouts up, which are usually the older adults. Um, and they used to think it was the only males, but, but females come too. It's the older adults. And, um, they set the path. Uh, and then after that, the, the younger ones um, follow them up. It's one of the few times that they're not in a huge mass. Um, when, they, when they leave uh, from Texas and they're heading south for the winter, uh, they do so in, in these large groups. Um, they're very social and very group uh, oriented. So, They've been living with with humans, with us us wonderful but sometimes messy humans, um, for thousands of years, uh, and uh, the Native Americans, um, especially along the east, uh, kind of the eastern uh, part of uh, what is now the United States, um, 
started hanging, they would um, hollow out gourds and hang them in the tree in a kind of a structure or sometimes even in trees. And the purple martins loved them and they said, cool, let's nest here. Um, because they've been doing that for so long, they are pretty much, especially in the eastern part of the United States uh, and Canada, uh, exclusively nest in human made structures, um, which is there's there's three birds um, that have done that. One is a chimney swift, um, barn swallow, and then the uh, purple martins. Purple martins have probably been, have been doing it the longest. Um, <laughs> excuse me. And it was a win-win for both the birds as well as the humans. Um, they, the birds eat all kinds of insects um, and they also are territorial. So they would keep away other birds from um, you know, cultivated fields and, and their gardens and things. Um, and so that, you know, that was beneficial to the humans as well. Not to mention, um, it just feels good to have birds around and, and feel like you, you have a, um, you know, this sort of uh, known species that's going to come uh, to the space every year. When, um, when John James Audubon was uh, making his journey throughout the United States, he noted that different innkeepers would put Purple Martin houses out um, at their inns. And, and he noted in his journals that uh, the fancier or the better uh, the Purple Martin house, um, you were guaranteed that it was going to be the better inn. Um, and so he often looked at those to see which one had the nicest um, uh, Purple Martin boxes and, uh, and he would choose where he was going to stay from that. So I thought that was kind of a, an interesting little fun fact um, about Mr. Audubon as he was making, making his rounds. So this is a purple martin. Um, the male is uh, on uh, the left side. He's darker. He has this kind of purplish, beautiful sheen about him. Um, and then the females, they're darker on the back, but then they have sort of a buff color um, on the front. And, and they are a little bit smaller um, than the males as well. They both have um, a fairly short beak, but it's very wide. And so when they actually open their mouth, it's quite wide so that they can really capture um, those insects. Um, everything from bees and wasps to moths, uh, crickets, uh, beetles, uh, flies. Uh, they don't eat mosquitoes. A lot of people think they do, and I wish that they did, but um, they do not. I'm sure that they have eaten one or two in their lifetime, but they're not, they're not a bird that really goes after them and consumes them in, in, in great quantity. So this is a male in flight, um, and uh, they are our largest um, swallow in North America. So we have several different other um, types of swallows, but this one is the largest. Um, and they also feed at the highest, uh, a much higher elevation than other swallows. Barn swallows, you'll see them sort of flying low along the ground or, or above a pond or a lake or something. Um, purple martins are quite high up there, 150 feet to 500 feet up, um, looking for those insects that are the higher flyers um, versus the ones that are sort of coming right off of the top of a lake or something um, that the, the barn swallows and even some of the cliff swallows and things, they'll come down lower um, to catch those. What I also find absolutely fascinating about these birds is they can travel uh, on average about 350 miles a day. Um, you know, some people have a hard time riding in a car for 350 miles a day, um, let alone doing that under their own effort. Um, and so it takes uh, roughly about, um, about 13 to 14 days, um, depending again on the weather and, and the winds, um, for a bird to go from the Amazon basin um, to the border of the um, United States and Canada. Um, and again, that's if, you know, good conditions, everything goes right, um, uh, which it doesn't always go right, <laughs> as you can guess, uh, extreme weather, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> is, is really hard on these birds, especially, um, cold, a cold snap can really do these birds in, um, if they, if they're, cold weather is coming, they'll actually, um, stop their migration, they'll retreat a little bit stay where they are um, before moving forward again, um, because it is, it, they just, they don't do well in it. They don't tolerate it. Um, when I was reading about them, um, it said that cold weather is actually the biggest um, 
uh, causes the biggest mortality of these birds. Um, but the good news is, is that they have, because they have such a huge um, uh, breeding grounds as well as wintering grounds, their populations are very strong. Um, they are not in any way, shape, or form uh, on a threatened look, list or endangered list. Um, they do really well. And, um, and they can have up to two to three uh, chicks uh, every season. And, you know, usually one or two of those uh, live to adulthood. And so, you know, they, they have a pretty good um, cycle as well. Um, the other thing that I think is is pretty cool about these um, lovely, lovely birds is they feed all in flight um, and they get the majority of their water in flight too, which is unusual for um, for birds. But they get a lot of that um, fluid that they need from the insects that they are eating. Um, but they also get it from, uh, you know, calm waters, so a lake or a pond or something, and they'll skim across it. Uh, scooping up uh, water as they skim and they'll, they'll make that circuit, you know, a couple times as they, they come in for that. But a lot of what they need um, is coming right from the insects um, that they eat as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the Pur Purple Martin Conservation Association has done an amazing job as well as Cornell Lab of Ornithology with uh, really studying these birds and helping us understand where are they located, um, you know, what are they doing, what are their travel habits, uh, what are they eating, you know, all of these things. Um, and so um, they have this uh, Project Martin Roost map, and it has all of the known roosts um, where the birds come into. So as soon as the chicks are born and they fledge, the adults start to um, form these, these very large roosts and they start to come together slowly at first and then more and more and more as the summer goes on. Um, and, and they collect up in these large roosts. There's a lot of different um, kind of, we'll, we'll say trains of thought that um, are, are trying to figure out why, why are they doing, what, not only why are they doing this, but what are they doing when they're doing it? What happens when they all come into these big roosts together? Um, you know, are they creating familiar bonds? Are they, um, you know, making sure that everybody is healthy enough to fly is one of the thoughts. You know, there's all kinds of different um, thoughts. And of course, we're, we're humans and we can't ask them. Uh, we would love to ask them, uh, we, hey, what are y'all doing there? Um, but we just have to sort of speculate on what happens when all these, um, you know, everybody's sort of coming together like this. Once the winds are right, the, everything is looking good for them, they will leave in mass and they'll start heading um, south again, um, down to their wintering um, areas. And they do so from each one of these roosting points. So they might start as far up as Minnesota, um, and then they've got to cross the United States as they come down um, and you know get get farther down into South America. The ones that live here in Central Texas, they don't have to go as far, um, but uh, as some of the other ones that are across the board there. The yellow dots are unconfirmed roosts. So it means that maybe maybe they were there one year, but now they're not anymore. Um, you know, maybe there's a group of birds that was there for a short period of time during the summer, but then they relocated into a bigger uh, group. Those are kind of the un what are called unconfirmed um, uh, locations as well. And you can see in the West, there's really only one, it's in Arizona, um, and, but the majority of them are here uh, in the East. What's also cool is Doppler radar will pick them up. Um, this is not a great picture of what it looks like on the Doppler radar, but what I loved about this picture was that um, the weatherman is reporting on it um, and showing that those are two of the big roofs that they know where they are. And as they're coming together in the evening, um, they, they can see them on Doppler radar. Uh, we can see a lot of bird migration now on Doppler radar, uh, especially as they're, they're leaving at night. Um, to start their migration. So a little bit about con the conservation of these birds. Like I said, um, the Purple Martin um, Conservation Association has been working on this for a long time, but 
So one of the biggest threats, as I mentioned, um, cold weather or extreme weather, um, but pollution um, uh, is, is another one, especially um, from pesticides and agricultural uh, pesticides, a big, you know, systematic uh, use of those. Uh, habitat loss in the wintering um, countries, uh, especially in the in the rainforest. Um, and then predation from European starlings and sparrows, house sparrows. Those are two birds that were brought over from Europe um, and they are pesky and um, will take over a purple martin um, house. So if you do have one, um, and, and I hope you think about getting one, if you don't, you know, make sure that you're um, protecting them against the European starlings and the um, and the house sparrows. Uh, as you know, as once the purple martins arrive, they'll take care of that pretty well. Um, although sometimes the European starlings will get in there and kill the eggs if both parents uh, have left for a little bit. So European starlings are kind of um, uh, a little bit of a nuisance bird. I'm not supposed to say that, but I think they are. Um, so you can install a Purple Martin um, apartment box or house. Um, uh, I think they're a great project at schools. Uh, they, you know, it's a great way for kids to be able to see the birds. Um, you can put them, you know, work, a church. You can get together as a neighborhood, uh, put one in your neighborhood. Um, you know, um, if you do put one in, as I mentioned, make sure you have a management plan. Make sure you're cleaning it out, keeping it clean, um, that kind of thing. And, um, and there's very specific height, you know, that you're supposed to put in a certain height. And uh, again, the purplemartin.com um, uh, has all of those specifics for you, if that's something that you're um, interested in. And then I always love to say, you know, share, share what you learn and engage others. You know, take somebody out to go to one of the Purple Martin parties um, with you or, you know, get a group of kids or, you know, to get out there. I mean, it really is a spectacular. It's like going to watch the bats but I think it's even cooler. Um, you know, the bats emerge and then they're kind of gone. The purple martins are they swirling and, you know, it's kind of this big ritual that happens, um, you know, as the sun's going down and um, it, it's, it lasts a little bit longer. I think it's even cooler. And then of course, you know, make a donation to any of the conservation groups um, that you, you know, you, that you know and enjoy. Travis Audubon, the Purple Martin um, Conservation Group, and then I also put the Nature Conservancy on here, and you don't have to necessarily pick the Nature Conservancy, but any kind of conservancy that helps set aside habitat. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of that, and I think we need to do, uh, you know, more of that as, as we can and we're able um, so that we're protecting the nesting um, grounds for these birds, but also the important flyways as they come through, <laughs> through Texas. Um, on their way, um, both north and south. Excuse me for a second. <laughs> so as I mentioned earlier, the Purple Martin parties um, are um, three or four weeks in July, <laughs> as well as in August. And then the same weekends uh, in Houston as well. So if you're down, um, down that way, you want to join one of the Houston Audubon um, uh, events, uh, feel free to join them. Houston Audubon does wonderful things as well as, as Travis Audubon. Um, they have lots of sanctuaries uh, down along the Gulf Coast. Um, if you ever get a chance to visit any of those um, down there. And then, um, you know, uh, if you want to go birding, uh, especially as, you know, thinking about um, this fall, the fall migration usually starts in August. People think, oh gosh, August, that seems really soon, but that's that's usually when the purple martins leave, um, followed by the hummingbirds, followed by everybody else. Um, those are the kind of the first to leave. Um, and and usually as they go, the purple martins, there's a there's a lot of uh correlation between the purple martins and the common nighthawks. They usually sort of follow each other's uh, routes back and forth. And um, and then, then the hummingbirds, the hummingbirds also will flock up like this, but they do so down on the coast, usually in September. Um, and then they head south uh, after that. And then, like I said, everybody else starts coming through. Um, usually, you know, October is usually the, the busier month for uh, the fall migrations. 
which I think are e equally as exciting. The birds are not in their big, you know, pretty breeding plumage um, usually, but um, they're so exciting to see. And we also see a lot of the shorebirds coming back at that time. The ducks, the geese, the sandhill cranes, you know, um, the Texas has front row seats twice a year um, to one of the largest migrations um, in the world. And, um, and everything funnels right down through um, what's called the Mississippi Flyway and the Central Flyway come, both come right through Texas. Uh, and we get to see those amazing creatures uh, come through twice a year, along with the bats and the butterflies, all using the same, uh, same routes there. So if you do want a copy of Parking Lot Birding to plan some fun adventures for yourself, uh, you can find it at Book People and Book Woman, pretty much any stores, bookstores here in Austin, um, including the Borders Bookstore, which was right next to where the roost was in, in 2020, uh, which was kind of fun. Um, you can also order it through Aiden Press. You can order it on Amazon and one of those as well, but I like to support our, our local bookstores um, as much as we can. So that will kind of conclude my spiel. Um, and then I'm just want to hear from y'all, hear what kind of questions you have. And, um, you know, uh, I'm not a I'll disclaimer. I'm not a biologist, so I can't go deep in the weeds of the, the biology of uh, the purple martins or other birds. Uh, but I certainly am happy to talk about uh, their, their habits and, uh, and where they will be. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. Before we jump into the q and I just want to tell everybody if you have questions, um, you can start posting them now and we'll get to as many of them as we can. I'm also going to be posting some links into the chat for the BCP story site to learn a bit more about the BCP, uh, as well as our BCP events calendar and an interactive map so you could find where the BCP is located around you. That's posted. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jaya for some questions. All right, thanks, Jeremy. And thank you for that presentation, Jennifer. So we got some questions coming in. Um, first question, do the purple martins continue to roost in huge groups during winter in South America? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is yes, they do. Um, they, uh, like I said, they're very social birds. Um, the, the only time that they really stop being in those, those big, huge groups, um, like I said, when the adults, um, the older adults first leave to kind of scout out the area and set the routes, um, then the, the younger ones come and they come in, a, you know, in flock um, to the United States, uh, <clears throat> to, you know, North America. But then once they breed, um, even though they're in those cluster boxes, um, usually between about 12 and uh, 8 and 12, you know, different um nesting pairs will be in those boxes. So they're still in small groups like that um, during the breeding season, but they're not in those huge flocks. And so that's the only time that they're really not in those um, those great big giant flocks like that. When they're down um, in South America, um, they're definitely, you know, they don't do the same um, roosting rituals that they do like when they're coming together in July, um, but they do stay together um, in, uh, in these large flocks. Great. Next question. What is the maintenance for a purple Martin house like? Yeah. So, um, um, there are, are definitely people that have uh, more authority on this than I do, but, uh, you know, at the end of each season, um, usually they're on a, on a big mast and they have a system that you can just lower them down and then you just clean them out. Um, they have like a little thing you can just empty them out. They don't, purple martins don't build a big nest um, like a house wren or a sparrow or something, um, but it does get, you know, um, dirty in there. Um, and so you clean those out. Um, and then the one, some of them have a little door that you can shut down. Um, and so if you shut the doors, then that keeps the sparrows and the starlings from taking those over during the rest of the year. So, and then you, you know, hoist it back up and, and put it up there uh, until the, until the spring. And then usually about March, you pull it back down and you open the doors back up. Um, some of them don't have that door feature, like some of the older ones don't have that door feature. Um, but um, I do, I have heard that those are really pretty handy. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit more maintenance than, um, than say, you know, my owl box that I have out there that I just 
open up the bottom and everything falls out and then that's kind of it, you know? <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a little bit more maintenance, but, but nothing, you know, horrible, but it does need to be done. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times um, if somebody doesn't clean it out or, or keep it up, you'll see the starlings and the sparrows and, you know, to kind of take it over. Great. Okay, next question um, is asking about light pollution. Are purple martins nocturnal migrators and does light pollution affect them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and they are nocturnal um, migrators um, as most songbirds are. Um, light pollution, uh, man, don't even get me started on light pollution. <laughs> um, it, it is a pet peeve of mine uh, for a long, long time. Um, it, it is, um, it's harmful, light pollution is harmful to us as well as children, um, as well as uh, basically all species of, of animals. But in particular for birds that are flying at night, um, it, it, if there's a building and the lights are coming out of it, um, it makes it very hard for them to tell the difference between the sky and, um, and that that's a building and they'll fly into it and they can, you know, kill themselves, um, especially if we're having, like we just did um, during um, the spring this year, where it was really, 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 really windy, um, you know, day after day after day. And those, those south winds were pushing the birds really fast um, through central Texas and, and through Texas in general. And normally, uh, you know, they would, um, if, if our buildings weren't here, I'll put it this way, uh, if our buildings were here, they would sail on through no problem. But um, they have to navigate now between, you know, Corpus, Houston, Dallas, and Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, all of these, you know, big city areas where you have lots of high buildings uh, now um, that they can run into. And so, yeah, light pollution is, is difficult. Light pollution also, with all the blinking lights, um, can... Um, it confuses uh, birds, uh, can get them off of their routes, um, you know, as, as they're migrating through at night. Um, <laughs> you know, then they also, um, they can't, it's harder for them to navigate um, as they're, a lot of them use the moon and the stars, just like we would um, before we had navigation systems. Um, and so getting them, not being able to see those uh, also makes it difficult. So yeah, light pollution is one of those things that um, it's, it's the pollution that we don't really often talk about. And so I was really, really glad when um, Audubon, National Audubon, and then um, all their partner organizations really started focusing on um, this lights out campaign. And so saying, you know, during the migration, let's turn off as many lights as we can. Uh, really, you know, create those dark skies uh, for Avery and friends and help them um, on their journey, uh, you know, as they as they move along. So I'm, I'm really glad they started that campaign. It's been very well received, um, I will say, and, and several cities have really taken it to heart and done an excellent job with turning off the lights at night. Okay, next question. What are some good local parking lots for birding by ear? Ooh, for birding by ear. Well, that's a wonderful question. Um, gosh, you know, it's, it's really interesting you say that. I was just outside this morning thinking, yeah, everybody's sort of stopped their mating um, calls right now, uh, except for the mockingbird. He was still still rattling on. Um, let's see. I, I think in Austin, um, I would definitely recommend McKinney Falls State Park. Um, you know, that's a great one. You've got the, the mix of the forest and the grasslands there. Um, you know, you can kind of just listen um, in that. That's a great birding park uh, if you haven't been there. Um, of course, there's always Hordens We Bend, uh, wastewater treatment plant, which if you uh, have a strong sense of smell, that might not be the place for you. Um, but uh, for listening, um, they've, you know, there's, there's plenty of species there uh, to listen for. Um, I, this is a little outside of Austin, but um, I'm a big fan of Bastrop State Park, obviously, since I used to work there, but um, I also, it, it's fun, really fun to listen to the forest there because it's, there's, there's a lot of intensity. You've got all the different woodpecker sounds, um, 
you know, this time of year, you've got the pine warblers and you've got um, uh, painted buntings and summer tanagers all um, nesting there as well. So that's a fun park um, to listen in. There's lots of hawk activity there as well. Um, let me think about other parking lots that would be great. Of course, you know, um, I, I always love uh, Zilker Park, um, listening down there. You know, the, the grackles uh, down there, there's uh, the yellow bell cuckoos uh, making their um, sounds and noises. Uh, when I was at the pool, Barton Springs, uh, not so long ago, I saw green herons go by. So just listening there, um, even though it's predominantly the grackles, uh, you know, you'll start hearing other things uh, that are kind of the underpinning of, of those uh, noises as well. Um, yeah, I'd say those are kind of my top three for, for listening. Um, you know, I'll throw in um, out, you know, kind of west, um, Rhymer's Ranch. Uh, they've, they've got a, their parking lot and then they've got kind of a, sh a sh real short rim walk that's right there. It's an ADA trail, which is nice. And, um, just listening to the breeze pass by and the birds in the trees there, that's, that's a great one to go to as well. That's a great question. They're great suggestions. Thanks. Um, so, okay, next question is, can you talk a little bit more about why the Purple Martin spends so many days in a row circling in the sky, um, kind of the function of that? You'll have to explain that a little better. Circling in the sky, like, like circling in the roost or um, when they're circling around their nesting area? Circling around uh, their nesting area. So going on the nesting area, right? yeah. So um, they're once once they pair up and they're and they've nested. Um, there's usually one flying um, all the time, and obviously they're feeding. Um, but it, they're also um, keeping watch for uh, predators and other uh, birds that might come into the area. You can hear them talking all the time. They're they're kind of constantly talking and checking in with each other. Um, but they're also feeding as they're up there. But there's also this sort of um, there's a social connection um, that's constantly happening between them. And again, we don't fully understand all of it um, because only they know what they're saying to each other. I wish we did. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's their primary function is, is they're checking to make sure everything's secure. Um, if there is something harmful coming, um, you know, they can warn the others and, and they'll leave the boxes and then they'll come back. Um, and again, you'll see that too with when they come into the big roost, and like I said, they're making all this noise and then there's like this split second where it's silent before they all take off. And sometimes, you know, again, they, they're not 100% sure what's happening in all of that. But if a hawk was to come, which, or an owl, which they often do, because it's a target rich environment, shall we say, um, you know, they're sending out a signal saying, you know, everybody go. Um, and and they know that they have that safety in numbers um, when they're leaving in big mass like that. Okay, they circle up, they come around, threat's gone, they land back down. Um, and so that's kind of, I, I mean, again, I'm only speculating here, but they could be just testing that constantly to see, you know, it's like a, like a fire drill that they're doing multiple times as they come into roost. Uh, again, we, we don't have, you know, full information on what all that, um, what exactly it serves. Okay, and we do have some uh, clarification with the question as well. Uh, the behavior that we see in parking lot parties in late July, um, mm -hmm. is there any reason behind that? Is it kind of similar? Yeah, that's what I was just describing that li that later part that I was talking about when um, when they're all coming into the big roost um, and they'll you know they'll they'll leave the tree for a second and then they come back and they they'll you know make a big circle and so you know either a like I said they're um, communicating about a threat coming um, or you know there's also um, some speculation that they're also as they come in, there's a lot of hierarchy and you'll notice like certain birds are up top and then, and, and when they come back in, they're going to continue to be up there. And so, you know, they're, they're constantly kind of jockeying for this. 
So as they leave and they come back, they're resettling into that hierarchy, um, you know, is, is another, that one is a little bit more documented, I think, um, you know, as they, as biologists and stuff are looking at um, birds and their, their behavior and what all they're doing there. I hope that answers what, what you were answering uh, question there. I believe so. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next question, how are purple martins and barn swallows similar and different? Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the purple martin is bigger um, and, um, and the males have that um, kind of very purple sheen um, look uh, throughout their body. Um, the males of a barn swallow are smaller. They have a forked tail. Um, let me see if I can. Um, well, the barn swallow has a, a forked tail, um, and they have a rust color on their uh, on their front. Um, the females don't have. Um, the females have a kind of a light color. The females of both species are similar. However, barn swallows are smaller um, than the. Uh, um, the purple martins. And again, one of their biggest distinction is the height of which they're flying. So barn swallows are going to come down kind of lower. They're skimming the tops of trees or, or grasslands, um, you know, going over water and stuff. Purple martins are typically up higher, coming down once in a while, you know, if there's a, a big, you know, insect, uh, <clears throat> you know, kind of explosion happening or, um, if they're coming down, you know, to get water, and then they go back up to those higher elevations, um, which the insects that they prefer are up at those higher um, altitudes when they're feeding. So visually, I will say visually, um, they're quite different, again, because that fork tail and, and then the barn swallows have that rusty sort of color on the front of them. And they're very, I think, I think the barn swallows are very pretty too. No, I love the, the barn swallows. There's a nest of them uh, nearby and they're, they're great. They're cute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So next question, can you talk about some of the notable sightings you've made at parking lots in, in and around Austin? In and around Austin. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, so let me think about some of my favorite ones. Um, well, I, I actually today, um, I uh, ran up to the post office and um, drop off some letters and stuff. And there was a um, red shoulder hawk just sitting there looking at me like, hey, good to see you this morning. Um, so that was kind of fun at the, um, in the parking lot this morning. Um, I think that, uh, I think some of my favorite, even... <laughs> This is going to sound funny, but when I worked at Texas Parks and Wildlife, we had all kinds of unusual things showing up uh, in the parking lot out there. And I would go out there a lot to talk on the phone or, you know, um, have lunch or something. And because uh, that's where the picnic table was, is out there. And, you know, Crested Car Car would come by. Um, you know, we had all kinds of uh, hawks uh, and Mississippi kites that would show up uh, over there, which was always exciting to see um, in, in those areas. Um, I live in North Austin, so I'm not too far from, um, uh, Mill Pond, uh, which is, um, right up the road, uh, here. If you haven't been to Mills Pond, um, it's a great place to go during the spring migration. Um, they get a lot of, uh, warblers and stuff there and you can park as soon as you're in the parking lot. It's a very small parking lot, but as soon as you're there, the trees right above you, um, have all kinds of you know, migratory birds that are coming through. Um, they're not there right now because they've, they've already passed through, but it's, it's quite a little migrant trap up there. Um, and that's a really great one uh, to have that experience in. I would say Berry Springs Park, which is actually up in Georgetown, uh, is another one that I, my husband and I were doing a Greater Texas Birding Classic uh, Regional Big Day and we pulled up and they have uh, these beautiful pecan trees uh, out there. Pecan trees and live oaks are kind of the grocery stores for migrating birds. And um, because of the caterpillars uh, and, and insects that they, uh, they have on them. And the, the pecan trees 
were just, it was like they were lit up with yellow warblers and, um, and uh, orioles. Um, there was, you know, three or four different types of flycatchers that were there that morning. And everything, it was like the, the tree was just moving with all of this color. And so, yeah, Berry Springs was another one that uh, I just remember like stepping out of the car going, hmm, it's going to be a pretty good day today. Um, and that's a great park uh, to go to as well. And <clears throat> what I like about that park is even in the winter, um, it's a good park to go to. They get a lot of sparrows in there. They've done a great job with their prairie restoration, just like out at Commons Ford Park, which is another um, great park to go to. And that, that prayer restoration has really helped bring back a lot of the sparrows in the winter. So um, well, there's not a lot of people that really are like, man, I'm gonna go out today and see some sparrows. Um, but uh, I do, I like them. And um, I think they're kind of, um, they're hard to identify uh, the difference because they're, it's like one, one tiny streak will be different uh, on one sparrow than the other. And that's, you know, you have to get really close to identify it, but um they are, they are cool little birds and they love the grasslands. I hope that answers that question. Great, thanks. And then we have one, time for one more. Uh, what is your highest total species from the Texas Birding Classic? Oh my gosh. Um, what is our highest total? I think it's like 312 or something. This year wasn't as high as high. This was like 270 something um, this year. It was really windy. We were battling the winds and the weather um, this year. It seemed like a lot, um, not making excuses for our low totals, but um, yeah, it was quite windy this year. It was really um, an interesting um, migration season this year because the bird, the places that you thought the birds were going to be, a lot of times they were just passing right over because the winds were just moving them um, as they come across the Gulf of Mexico. They would just keep on going and not landing and dropping down um, along the coastline, which is usually where they go, uh, which interesting enough, a lot of them were coming here um, and they were at places like Berry Springs and Mills Pond uh, and uh, in, in Central Texas. Um, so yeah, this year was, um, I'd say this was our one of our harder years um, as far as birding went because of the winds. Right. Well, so don't quote me on those numbers. I got to go look them up. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for a great presentation and having so much uh, to say with these questions. Uh, I think it went really great. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And like I said, um, you know, uh, people can reach out to me on my website too, which is uh, theatomiccowgirl.com and, um, or pick up, pick up a copy of the book uh, and go have a good time outside. All right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in and go ahead and wrap up. Thank you again, Jennifer. Thank you.